All right, folks, we're just going to wait a few minutes um, and give our friends and neighbors a chance to hop on. Um, so good to see so many um, familiar names and faces jumping on this morning. Um, we will certainly go around um, and just make sure that we know who uh, is with us this morning and who they're representing. Um, and as we always do, we'll do a quick little um, uh, teaser question um, as part of introductions. And so the, the question today, um, I always try to think about the theme. And um, I feel like because today is the beginning of um, the sort of state fair run, um, I've been thinking a little bit about the, the bounty of the Wisconsin harvest. And um, what, is the, what is the one thing grown um, in Wisconsin um, that you most look forward to, to eating uh, during the spring, summer, or fall? Um, I know everybody's got their particular thing. I grew up in a household where my mom was sweet corn crazy. Uh, we ate it really starting, I would say, frankly, way too early in the season. And we would eat it until the last year of corn came off the stalks. And um, for that reason, I don't eat corn anymore. Um, I know it's, it's, it's uh, not a popular thing to say in Wisconsin, but... Um, so my mom would say sweet corn. I say the thing that I most look forward to are those um, are those Wisconsin strawberries. I just love those uh, fresh Wisconsin, and it's a, such a short season, two weeks long. Uh, but I just love those strawberries, and I uh, can't get enough of them during those two weeks. Pick a ton of them, freeze them, try to try to make them last as long as possible. So I'm looking for what's the What's the, the, the one thing growing in this state that you just can't get enough of when it's in season? Um, and we will, I'm gonna give it one more minute. I always like to give everybody that extra bit of grace. And then um, I am going to just go by, um, by uh, agency and see if we have representatives. And then um, certainly if you're representing your agency, just um, your name. Uh, the agency you're representing, your role at that agency, and then uh, and then that answer to that question, which again is, what's that one thing grown in the state of Wisconsin that when it's in season, you just can't get enough of? Uh, and that's in honor of State Fair kickoff and really the best part of the growing season, I think, is right around now. My tomatoes are really rocking and rolling, which is great. Um, so I think we are ready to go. I think we've got a strong um, contingent here and we will start. I know we are joined on the phone um, by Governor Evers and First Lady Evers. They are actually on their way to the State Fair opening ceremonies as we speak. So they'll be with us as long as possible this morning. Uh, and I wanna start with both of you. Do you have an answer to the question of Wisconsin's magnificent bounty? Let's see. Governor, you might be double muted. I don't know. We were just chatting a second ago, so I know they're on. Yes. Oh, there he is. Here we are. Yep. Okay, here we are. <laughs> so um, I just, this is First Lady Kathy Evers, and I just love the Portage County baked potato stuff with lots of Wisconsin cheese. Ooh, good one, Kathy. And uh, this is uh, this is governor, and I am very fond of Door County cherries that they put on vanilla ice cream at the state fair. Sounds wonderful, Governor. Well, you guys have a wonderful, maybe fifty third state fair in a row uh, opening ceremonies. Have a great have a great day, and thanks for being with us this morning. Thank you. All right. Um, we will go over to um, our friends at DWD. Do we have anyone on from DWD this morning? Oh, hi, Secretary. This is Danielle Williams. I'm the Assistant Deputy Secretary here at DWD. Um, my favorite is also strawberries. I will say for a long time, our garden had them and they would come back all season. And then we had to replace the batch. And now we have them where they just grow once and it's been very disappointing the last two seasons. But yes, I'm with you all about the strawberries in Wisconsin. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks for being here. 
Um, we will go over to DHS. Let's see, I know we have Deb on. Deb, do you wanna introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. This is Deb Rathamal. I'm the director for the Bureau of Children's Services at DHS. Um, I gotta say, I'm gonna stick with the strawberry theme, although I did just re um, start an al a childhood allergy to strawberries has resurfaced in my recent years. So I have to eat them with uh, caution, but I still have to, I still have to. Thanks for having me. Great, thanks. And uh, appreciate you being here, Deb. You're also gonna be one of our presenters today and, and certainly appreciate that. Um, great, we will go over to WEDC. Anybody from WEDC this morning? Hi, I'm Kate Constantly. I'm the Assistant to Secretary Hughes, so I'm stepping in for her today. Happy to be here. Great. Thanks, Kate. And do you have any um, special uh, Wisconsin Bounty foods? Um, uh, there, I guess I'll have to go with sweet corn. There's some family friends of ours back in Westby that have probably the best sweet corn I think ever. <laughs> <laughs> so very biased, but there's just the best. That's good to know. Um, all right, thanks for being here, Kate. Um, we will go over to DOT. Anybody from DOT this morning? Yes, it's Kathy Bellick. I'm a ledge liaison for DOT. I would have to say that as much as I love summer and I live for summer, I love apple season and going apple picking with the kids. Yes, apples run a close second for me. Um, I almost treat them like I don't know, almost like wine or something like that. I love all the different varieties. Um, exactly. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here this morning. All right. Anybody from DVA here this morning? Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's Mary Kolar, Secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, as a Wisconsin native, I really appreciate sweet corn season. So thank you, Kate. I might have to check out your family in Westby. Uh, just had some sweet corn last night, and I want to share that sticking the hole with the husks and everything in, in the microwave and peeling them back, it comes off really easy. And put that butter and salt and pepper on, and you've got a great meal. I love it. Thank you so much, Secretary, for being here this morning. Appreciate you. Um, I'm not sure if I see anybody from DNR, but I'll certainly ask anyone from DNR here this morning. All right. How about um, DOR? I believe I see my colleague, Secretary Barca. Good morning. Great to be with you. Absolutely. Uh, for me, I'll second your motion there, Emily. Uh, strawberries, anyone that knows me would know that it, it would have to be Kenosha, Wisconsin, Thompson, the Thompson Strawberry Farms, which used to be on our backyard practically. So uh, now we got to drive out to the county, but it's uh, always terrific. Strawberries and bananas go so well together. It's like pork chops and applesauce. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Secretary, for being here this morning. Um, over to um, DOA. Anybody on from DOA today? Yes. Thank you, Secretary, for having me. This is Olivia Huang, the Assistant Deputy Secretary over at DOA here for um, Secretary Designee Blumenfeld. Um, I, you know, I, I want to second uh, or third or fourth the strawberries, but I also want to say um, the edible wildflowers, which are beautiful to look at as well as to throw on salads. So um, the wildflowers in Wisconsin just do not stop. And I love them so much and also pretty tasty. So I'll throw that in there. Wow, I like that. Um, yes, there's no better way to make a boring salad less boring than throwing a few wildflowers on top of it. Love that, Olivia. Thanks for being here. Um, over to our friends at DOC. I believe I see my colleague, Secretary Carr. Hi, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Emily, for um, um, hosting the meeting today. And um, I love to eat and I love to eat things grown in Wisconsin. So, you know, it's hard for me to pick one favorite. So the apples, the corn, the strawberries, they're all big favorites of mine. So 
Um, I, I, I'm sorry, but I can't just pick one favorite. It's like having, you know, picking your favorite child. I love the honesty. I appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, all right. I believe I see Jessica on over at WIDA. Jessica. Yep. Hi, I'm Jessica Bowling. I'm assistant deputy director at WIDA. I'm stepping in for Elmer Moore. He is away at this time. Um, I am a little embarrassed to admit this, but I actually, I'm not a Wisconsinite, so I actually have not been really paying attention to my produce or where it's, where it's come from. So I'm not, I don't really have a favorite at this point, but I do know that I'll be trying the strawberries now. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jessica, for being here. Um, would love to go over to DFI. Good morning. Um, I had some technical difficulties, so I didn't hear the question, but from gathering what everyone said, it's favorite grown food. If it's grown, I would say corn. If it's favorite summer food, I'd say the cream puffs at the fair, but both work for me, Kathy. Um, yeah, it's it. We were focused on on things grown in Wisconsin that we just can't get enough of. But you know what? I think cream puffs pretty much count um, for Wisconsinites. So, yeah, yeah I, I love family that. that comes all over the country for the cream puffs. Oh um, my goodness! Yeah, I love it's a it. Great time. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, we will go over to DPI. I know my former colleague, Jenny Biebler, is on the line. Jenny. Hi, everybody. I have to go with um, the tomatoes. As long as you put a slice of fresh mozzarella cheese and basil from my garden and drizzle it with olive oil, I could eat that daily. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, anyone else from DPI on the line? Just want to make sure. Okay, wonderful. Um, we will go over to um, uh, Campy, Rebecca. Good morning, Secretary. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, Rebecca Murray with the Child Abuse Neglect Prevention Board. Uh, I'm gonna go with apples just because of where I grew up um, by Ashland and Bayfield, um, that that just brings back childhood memories too. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Rebecca. We'll go over to the Office of Children's Mental Health. Linda? Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, not a native of Wisconsin, and when I moved here, what blew me away was the musk melon at the, from the farmer's market. I, I don't know. I just like, if the season's not long enough, I can, the, the way it melts in your mouth, I've never tasted it like that, and so I love that every year. Thank you for that. I am not a melon fan, but um, the rest of my family is. So I, um, I definitely understand the love um, while it's not personal to me. Um, thanks for being here, Linda. Uh, all right, I think, um, I think that was my list. Are there any agent, anybody representing an agency that I didn't call out this morning? And or does anybody just have to say a food? Anybody who hasn't spoken yet have to say a food that has not been represented yet. All right, just need to give voice to that. Um, I do wanna welcome, um, we have uh, a great agenda today. I wanna welcome Trisha Murphy as well, who is, um, uh, representing Parent Voice today with us and um, really appreciate you being here, Tricia, and, and also you hanging on through our agenda um, because um, as we can see on your Zoom, you got a cute little one there that um, that is going to keep your hands full as well um, and love that. Yeah. Actually, there'll be five of them that will probably be coming in and out. <laughs> well, you know so. what? We wouldn't be we wouldn't be living our values around uh, early years if we didn't um, if we didn't love that. So uh, appreciate you being here, and um, we'll roll with it this morning. Thank you. All right. Um, so. Just to get us going this morning, um, really, really um, happy to, to be back with you all um, this morning. I really hope everyone is having a good summer. I've definitely um, gotten away a few times uh, with my family. It's always my favorite time of year when my children are not in school uh, to be able to spend a little bit more time with them. 
Um, so I hope everybody is taking a little bit of time for themselves um, through this summer as well and, and spending time with people that they really enjoy uh, in this wonderful state that we live in. Um, I will ask um, before I get too far into our agenda this morning um, for approval of the draft minutes from April 28th. Um, so I need a motion and a second to approve those minutes, please. Peter Barca, make the motion that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Peter. Rebecca Murray, I'll second. Appreciate that. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, all in favor of approval of the minutes? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? All right, that motion. Thank you. We'll move on. All right. Um, so, between, um, I, I guess I, I want to just that clean up a little bit on some things that we've talked about this year. Um, in January, we talked about some of the benefits of creating innovative partnerships between businesses and economic development and other community organizations. And um, to that end, uh, again, I would like to invite uh, Danielle Williams to share um, and, and sort of connect some dots around some announcements made uh, just recently that build on some of those prior Leadership Council on Early Years topics um, and, and intersect with today's conversation. So, um, Danielle, do you want to share a little bit about um, Workforce Innovation Grant announcements? Sure, thank you. Yes, we did have another really competitive round of uh, Workforce Innovation Grant applications. Uh, which the governor then announced the awards back in June and then early July as well. Um, during this round, we received about 192 applications totaling more than $680 million in funding requests. Um, you might recall from my presentation this spring, we had about 40 million available initially, um, but thankfully the governor was so impressed by the applications we received that he actually went above and approved some additional funding so we were able to award an additional 15 projects that total about $68 million. So it was really exciting, um, really take the gamut of different uh, challenges addressing the labor force. And, uh, but of most interest to this group today, uh, three of them really primarily focused on issues related to childcare. Um, the first was developed by the Community Relations Social Development Commission. And they had the Early Childhood Education Workforce Training Project. Um, and through that, they're developing an ECE worker training and pipeline program where they're hoping to or 105 trainees over the three years to help address providers' inability to recruit and, retrain, and retain uh, their staff. So this program will establish free workforce training for students to earn stackable and portable credentials. Um, which will hopefully lead to professional advancement and retention. They'll provide wraparound services and case management services to students to remove any barriers that prevent their completion of the coursework. And then they're also going to be helping the EC businesses by helping them improve their Young Star ratings and therefore increasing revenues and offering some more sustainable wages for staff. Um, and so then with the graduates, they'll help them connect with partner EC sites so that they can accept positions. Um, and they will really be part, um, targeting low-income Black and Brown Milwaukee zip codes with this project, um, which we know and we've discussed that they have the biggest gaps in access. Um, the second project was developed by Mobilize, um, which is, this is really interesting. So their project was Workforce Transportation Solutions for Working Parents. And so they are addressing both transportation and child care barriers. Uh, the, if for those who aren't familiar with Mobilize, they are really focused on the challenge that without reliable transportation, access to quality childcare and good jobs are very limited. Um, and a lot of the workforce transportation solutions currently offered in different communities are just focused from home to work and back. And so that leaves childcare out of the question. And so where they're not serving working parents and, and disproportionately single mothers. So with their project, um, they are building on Milwaukee's Flex Ride program. Um, and this project connects Milwaukee neighborhoods with businesses out in the Menominee Falls and Butler area. And so they will not only be expanding their services so that they can go to other 
um, industrial parks and job centers throughout the suburbs from Milwaukee, but they are also going to be adding um, different mobility hubs, they're calling it, um, which will be at high quality childcare centers where that are on key bus routes so that families and parents can be there, drop off their kiddos, and then um, get their ride to work. And so recognizing the facts of um, parents, they will also be offering emergency ride home and then hire community liaisons to help the parents navigate the childcare market as well. So that was a really interesting project. Um, and then the third one I just wanted to highlight was put forth by LISC, which is the Local Initiative Support Corporation. And there is really innovative approach, I think. Um, and so their issue is trying to address EC providers, um, trying to keep and retain their teachers, who, as we know, um, have pretty low wages. And so based on a survey that they had conducted, they found that many of the teachers are spending more than 50% of their income on housing. And for those who don't know anything about 30% of your income means that you're housing burdened. So this is really a big struggle, struggle to help them keep teachers in the industry. Um, so their group of partners in the Milwaukee area came together to figure out how to build affordable housing at scale through the collective affordable housing plan. And so their project will be a pilot where they build 50 homes that are affordable for ECE teachers in Milwaukee to purchase. So they become homeowners. And then the pilot is going to be comparing the hiring and retention of those participants with the control group. And the idea is that when it's successful, um, they can have the pilot replicated at scale by philanthropic and government housing subsidies. So those are sort of the big uh, projects that work to address some of the challenges with childcare. Um, but we did have several others that um, really are maybe career paths, employment training, and then want to provide wraparound services um, and then have specifically called out childcare as one barrier. So we had about four others that really focused on that. And I, I won't spend the time to go through those details, but feel free to follow up with me afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Danielle. And I just, again, I marvel at, um, you know, when we, when we started the Leadership Council on early years, one of our goals was to really try to create a forum that allowed these kinds of relationships to develop and um, and that would yield the kind of innovation that we see over and over again in these in these workforce innovation grants. And just I just have to give props to Danielle for a second because for a for a little bit of her her talk just now, she sounded 100% like a DCF employee, and um, and you know was pretty deep down in the weeds. And that's exactly um, that's exactly I think at the heart of the leadership council on early years is that um, this this sort of like Wisconsin um, kids and family, you know, Wisconsin kids and families is is really about all of us, and um, and I think that some of the solutions that we see in the workforce innovation grants understand that um, that keeping kids and families strong in community means communities get stronger, means the economy gets stronger, and um, and that's just a really cool thing to see replicated um, at the state level, but also in communities across Wisconsin. So thanks to Danielle. Thanks to DWD and WEDC, the governor's office, DOA, for all of the innovation around uh, workforce innovation grants, um, because we really do see the the footprint of this of this group on in impacting some of the um, some of the the results. So appreciate that, Danielle. Um, we also just want to call out. Uh, at our at our April meeting, uh, our friends from IRP talked about advancing economic mobility for families, reducing poverty, and improving the lives of families. Uh, last month, the city of Madison announced the Madison Forward Fund, and this is something that we just want to call out. This is an experimental program in which the city is partnering with IRP to administer a year-long guaranteed income pilot program. Um, it's an experimental program. It's geared towards Madison residents. The guaranteed income is a monthly cash payment of $500 given directly to 155 households for 12 months. It's unconditional. There are no strings attached and no restrictions on how the money can be spent. Um, and so this is this is very much in line with some of the experimental, some of the emerging research that's happening around um, guaranteed income. 
and uh, the it, again the impacts on on kids and families. And so this is something that's going to be studied over the next uh, 12 months, but it's happening right here uh, in the state of Wisconsin. So that's another exciting connection that we wanted to make from our our conversations here to the work that's actually happening on the ground. Um, so both of these, it's just it's it's exciting to see the real life examples coming coming to life. So I want to pivot to today's topic, um, which is um, really how do we connect across agencies um, and certain agencies in particular really um, really carry this responsibility heavily. Um, but how do we help our families who have young children um, that have disabilities? Um, as we know, early childhood is such a critical time to connect a child with disability programs and services. Um, we know that early intervention for these kiddos makes an absolutely um, huge impact on improving their future. We know that when you're raising very young children, regardless of um, what's going on with your kiddos, it's a challenging time, even under the best of circumstances. And families are often not certain about what their needs are or how to access programs, particularly when they live in a bunch of different places. And so um, it's challenging, it's cha challenging in the best of times to navigate systems. Um, and certainly when it's your heart and soul um, and sort of your singular focus as a parent um, to make sure that your kiddos are, are, are safe, loved, learning, thriving, growing, um, it's even more important. So um, we know that these investments that, that we make in our kiddos, um, and in particular our kiddos with disabilities, um, our, our investments in their success. And we, um, we know that investing early might mitigate the need for additional supports and services in our K-12 system and per perhaps even in, in other systems that we represent uh, later in life. Um, today's speakers are going to provide us a little bit of an overview about the programs that are already in place and also that connective tissue that helps to keep these programs connected across agencies so that it makes it ever easier for families. Um, we want to be able to demonstrate how we wrap supports around every child and every family and in particular um, those, those families um, that do have kids with disabilities. We're fortunate, um, as I mentioned at the top of the call, to have um, Trisha, a parent um, representative here today that can share her personal experience with us in navigating the system and getting those right supports for her child and for her family. My hope um, for today's discussion is that we identify how families with children with disabilities interact and connect um, to, each of, to, to each of our agencies. And so to set the foundation for today's conversation. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague from the department, Erin Arango Escalante, our division administrator for the Division of Early Care and Education. Um, she has, just like me, um, seen this from a couple of different angles over the years, um, back at Department of um, Public Instruction and now on the DCF side, but she's going to provide just a high level contextual um, information setting piece for us on what we call the birth to five system for children with disabilities. And it's gonna share some of the more specific ways that DCF programs and supports are helping to support young children. And then we'll hear from um, our colleagues and friends at DHS and, and also at DPI on how this system kind of fits and works together to create that support network. So with that, Erin, I'm gonna ask you to take it away. Sounds good. Good morning, everybody. We're gonna get our uh, PowerPoint up and going and we're gonna just get started in talking about the birth through five system as it relates to uh, special education. I just wanna say this topic is near and dear to my heart like it is for many of us. Um, not only did I, I focus on this at my time at the Department of Public Instruction, um, but also I had a child who participated in um, birth to three and really lived and breathed in this space from so many different perspectives for, for three years. So I'm gonna start by just sharing this slide. What this shows is we have a, a very complex system and it is, it's got complex for many reasons. At the center, you see our core early care and education programs. 
everything from four-year-old to kindergarten to childcare, Head Start, Early Head Start, Birth to Three, Early Intervention, Early Childhood Special Education, Home Visiting. I could keep going. Um, those are some of our, our core programs that, that really, um, really focus on supporting children and families. The Outer Circle really focuses on those, those other program areas that absolutely impact uh, our, our children and families, but they're not, they're like one step removed, if you will. Um, there's policy and program areas in here that that all of that many people on on this call oversee everything from tran transportation and housing to economic support to health support you name it um, safety and permanence I mean you I think you look at this and you can really see the the work that you do in the the various agencies um, lit, you know listed here. So again, this is something that this this birth through five system is something that we all we all own. We all have a, a important um, role in in really moving the needle here. And the next slide, I'm going to go just dig a little bit deeper into that, that middle square. Um, and I'm going to show you just a, a visual that represents the the system, the birth through five system. Um, both the programs, the services, and the location. So at the top, you will see the continuum um, for, for a child from birth up to age 21. And in the middle larger boxes, you're gonna see our Individuals um, with Disabilities Education Act Part C, which is our birth to three early intervention program that is housed within uh, DHS. And then you will see our Part B, Section 619 and 611, which are really housed within the Department of Public Instruction. And that's our early childhood special education. So three up to age six. And then our K-12 special education. So there's these systems, these programs that our families are navigating. And you're going to hear more about that um, when Trisha shares her story. But to layer on another piece, we have, we have uh, the location of where our children are. Um, and I think it's a really important to know how the intersection of our programs and services interplay with, with the location of, of the program in terms of where the child is. So you'll see that there is a 4K, there's 4K, and this is only just a few, um, but we have our four-year-old kindergarten where children are, and oftentimes children with disabilities are in those programs. You have childcare, which we've talked a lot about, where we have children receiving birth to three services that are in those programs, children receiving early childhood special education services, again, in those programs. And childcare goes up to age 12, so which means we have, we have children and students that are in our K-12 system in childcare. We also have Head Start and Early Head Start, again, where you see those, those connections to birth to three and early childhood special ed. So what this is trying to show is the, the connection between our, our systems and where, and where children are and what types of services they are getting and how it is, it's complex, um, but it's also um, aligned. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about one project in particular that really connects uh, childcare with our birth to three system. And this is a, a pilot program. So let's talk a little bit about um, inclusive birth to three childcare. One of the, the things that we've been looking at very carefully is the connecting the dots and the alignment between childcare and our birth to three program. And in fact, with our last round of our American Rescue Plan Act dollars, we have $16 million that was earmarked to focus on this collaboration between uh, childcare and our birth to three program. And the idea behind this particular program was to provide tuition for childcare for children who receive birth to three services. Um, it, we have funding for about 1,400 children statewide to again receive uh, childcare tuition 
um, and, and, and attend really a high quality program so that we're connecting our birth to three services and supports in childcare. There's a phased rollout. So we've actually started the first rollout out, um, August 1st, just a few days ago in our, our southern region. You can see that at the, the bottom of the map there. Um, so a number of, of counties have, have started. Um, and we, as we as we started, we, we found that there were there was, there was um, a lot of interest from families. A number of you know families that said, yes, I I would like into this this program, I would like, um, you know, to really begin connecting the dots in, in childcare in, in BERTA 3. And so we know that our, our funding here will need to be spent, um, you know, by, by June 30th in 2024, so we have some time to really roll this pilot out. We are going statewide um, October 1st. So by October 1st, all families in this state will have access, all families, I should say, receiving birth to three services will have access to tuition for childcare. And the next slide, I wanna talk about really the connecting the dots and the why behind why we're, why we're doing this. Uh, so from a, a systems perspective, we always look at the family, the, the, the provider in the program and the community. From a family perspective, we know um, that it is difficult for families to really find high quality childcare that meets their child's needs. This is really important. We wanna, we wanna focus on um, the child, the needs that they have and being able to support their needs in a, the least restrictive environment, an environment that is with their typically developing peers. We know that we wanna reduce that financial hardship. It is hard for families to be able to um, do so much when they have a child with a disability. And we wanna ensure that there are supports in place wrapping around the child um, to really focus on healthy growth, development, and just overall well-being. And so this is how this particular program supports the family. There are many other ways, but, but these are a few of those ways. We also want to support our child care providers. As it was noted earlier, child care providers have and, and continue to struggle financially. Um, they're in a better place in terms of revenue and funding um, due to a number of, of funding sources that have become available through COVID relief dollars. But this is a way that they know they have steady revenue coming in for each child that is participating in the birth to three um, program. They also know they have a connection to um, for support from birth to three that then supports each childcare provider in, in, in really making sure that they can support the children's overall well-being. There's a lot of collaboration between childcare providers and our birth to three program. And then in terms of community, we are overall increasing access to that high quality and affordable opportunities for all families, including those that have um, our families that have children with disabilities. So there's, there's win-wins all around here as we look at how we've connected the dots between childcare and birth to three, just with this project alone. It has been, um, just an incredible opportunity to really work closely with birth to three. And, you know, we're hoping that, that ideally this, this has some, some momentum and that we can expand not only to birth to three, but, but beyond. Um, and we're going to talk about really what that means later on in the, in the presentation. I also want to just look at our next slide. And as I talked about family, which was really important here, we, we want to just make sure that we, we have the parent voice that has been represented. And later on in the presentation, as Secretary Amundsen mentioned, we are going to talk with Tricia Murphy. Um, earlier on in our Leadership Council on Early Years, we talked about our Parent and Caregiver Equity Advisory Cabinet and having that live, those, those voices of parents and of caregivers from many different backgrounds. And I just want to mention, we have, we've put that into action. Um, we have launched our Parent and Caregiver Equity Advisory Cabinet with parents and caregivers from specifically from Beloit, from Adams County, and from the Lakota Ray Tribe. And later on, you're gonna hear from um, 
from Tricia Murphy from, from Adams County. And her story really will resonate as she is a parent that has participated in Birch to Three as well as early childhood special education. So I look forward to talking with her as well. So at this time, we are going to just switch gears a little bit. And Secretary Amundsen, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Erin, can I just, um, I wanna just put a fine point on the, the pilot um, just for folks who, um, because I think that, you know, two purposes, well, a number of purposes for the Leadership Council on early years, but for, for a program like the one that we are launching here on, um, on birth to three eligibility um, for, for child care tuition, um, if, I'm a, if I'm on this call and I know somebody in my neighborhood who might who might be interested in this program, what's the easy way to talk about it? And what's the easy, can you, can you just pretend that you're telling somebody in your neighborhood for a second about this and, um, and kind of make that connection so people can hear you talk, like kind of like a person who doesn't work at DCF? Yeah, absolutely. You're honestly, if you know a family that is receiving birth to three services, um, honestly, what, what you want to do is, is have them to contact their, their, their services coordinator um, right away to, to tell them um, that they are eligible for, for, for free childcare. Um, that is, that is the, the message that you want to, to send. It is such a great opportunity and, and, and that's the, the high level connection there. Um, to contact their, their, their services coordinator is the message you wanna send. Wonderful. That's super helpful. And I think the, um, the, the phrase free childcare was, um, was definitely one I was looking for in that description. It's, uh, um, so again, as we're looking to connect more families in our community to the opportunities um, out there, we know that childcare is beneficial in all kinds of different ways, um, but it's also prohibitively expensive. And um, and so for this um, for this subset of Wisconsin kids who are res already receiving birth to three services, it's a wonderful way um, to to be able to, as Erin said, to be able to be with their um, typically developing peers, to be able to be in a high quality enriched environment. Um, and to have those services all connected. Um, and, and frankly, to also give parents time and space to be able to do the other things in their life that, that they need to do because their lives are more complicated, um, uh, having um, kids with disabilities. So just for so many reasons, this is a really exciting program uh, for us. And then Erin, uh, one other question, um, Initially, and I know we're just launching this, what are we going to be looking for in terms of, so this is a pilot, we're going to be looking and studying this. Um, any initial ideas about the kinds of things you're looking for um, that would demonstrate success here? Yeah, impact and family. We know that families, when you have a, a child, let alone a child with a disability and having and having been there, your, your life is full of appointments and meetings and therapy. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are alleviating any barriers that families that families may be facing, child care being one of them. Um, so we want to know from the family perspective, but also from the, the provider perspective. Providers, um, and having been a, a child care provider as well, teachers are often nervous to take children with disabilities. They, they, they're worried that they can't meet their needs. It's very common. Um, and so families with, with disabilities often have less access than what even exists today to, to child care. And so we want to see an increase. We want to see there be collaboration and professional development in a sense of feeling like I can do this. I can support children with disabilities with varying abilities. And we want to see an, an increase in, in providers, but their willingness, their excitement, um, and their, their own professional development as well. Wonderful, thanks so much, Erin. Um, any other questions from our group um, before we, we pivot over to um, looking at this program through a slightly different lens? Oh, 
Okay. All right. With that, we will um, we will make the switch. Thanks so much, Erin. Um, now I would like to welcome uh, Deb Rathermel, um to talk a little bit more um, about the work that DHS does on this front with the Birth to Three program. So, Deb. Good morning, everyone. I love being here. I feel like you're speaking my language. I know I'm in the right room. Also, very excited about the pilot work with DCF um, for the inclusive childcare benefit. As I indicated um, at the introduction, my name is Deb Rathermel. I'm the director in the Bureau of Children's Services. Our bureau administers a number of programs that serve children and families with special needs and families in special circumstances in accessing community um, healthcare related programs and services. One of our flagship programs is the Birth to Three program, which I'm here to uh, share the framework of our state's early intervention program with you today, our Birth to Three program. And I'm very interested in your ideas, most specifically in the area of child find that will be the topic of my presentation today. Um, next slide, please. So Craft Court in the Birth to Three program uh, Birth to Three is federally administered um, under the Department of Health Services, Office of Special Education, affectionately referred to as OSEP. Birth to Three, as it's often called, is the Part C Early Intervention Program, um, which expanded um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act to include infants and toddlers in the 1980s. Part C requires that states have a statewide comprehensive and coordinated multidisciplinary interagency system, it's a mouthful, that provides early intervention services for infants and toddlers with disabilities and their families. In Wisconsin, that system is administered through the Department of Health Services, again, in the Bureau of Children's Services. Birth to Three serves children with disabilities who have, who have delays or disabilities. Um, families enroll in the, part, in the program and are supported by a team of professional providers. Primary services in Birth to Three include a service coordinator, special education coordinator, occupational speech, language therapy, mental health services, um, as well as support and services for adaptive uh, equipment and aids. Next slide, please. States have considerable flexibility or latitude in establishing their state's eligibility criteria. They usually fall under three main categories, A category being the at-risk category, B uh, meaning kids who are, who are not only not evidencing delay, but perhaps have are at risk of delay. Category B is, is um, defined by delays of some certain percentage. And then category C is kids with significant delays. Wisconsin's eligibility criteria as illustrated on this slide here falls somewhere between category A and B. We do not serve, um, we do not enroll children who are at risk, but our eligibility criteria for delayed children is relatively uh, open at a 25% delay. What that means for, for I think the purposes of this conversation most critically is children do not need to be significantly visibly impacted by their disability to benefit from or access birth to three. Uh, next slide, please. So following the eligibility requirement, uh, the next overview feature about Wisconsin's Birth to Three program is how is it operationalized? In Wisconsin, we are administered again in the Department of Health Services under the Medicaid program, Division of Medicaid Services in the Bureau of Children's Services. DHS receives an annual grant from, the, from OSEP every year. In addition to this federal grant, Birth to Three is funded with a chunk of GPR money and significant obligation from each local county or public health um, program, which is where locally all Birth to Three is operationalized in local communities. Next slide. A critical tenant of early intervention is that the state actively seeks out and supports access to potentially eligible children. 
that function is appropriately named the child find system. And each state's child find system is federally required to have a referral framework and network standards for appropriately identifying infants and toddlers, that eligibility criteria that I shared a moment ago, so that all infants and toddlers that are eligible are identified, located, and evaluated for enrollment. Part C, birth to three is an entitlement program in every state that it's offered. Next slide, please. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was a crisis for many of us for many reasons, we saw a near, a significant drop in access and enrollment in our birth to three program in Wisconsin, including a near stop in any referrals um, to, for, uh, at a statewide level. As you can imagine, as um, infants and toddler well baby appointments were stopped or were significantly delayed, uh, there was a significant reduction in community interaction and socialization, all of which are critical paths to our um, child find system, both formally and informally. The intent of this campaign, which was created in a crisis, which um, often is the catalyst for creating solutions, was the state um, uh, taking the lead, the Department of Health Services, on a campaign to create ready-to-use material for the birth of three local programs, advocates, councils, partners, and other stakeholders across the state to help promote uh, statewide access to birth of three. I will say prior to this campaign and the catalyst that COVID created for us, um, Child Find was uh, locally, the responsibility of each local birth to three program. So a great deal of variability in how, how able uh, any one program was locally in being able to uh, develop a robust child find system. Next slide. The goals of this public service campaign that we referred to as the first 1000 days, and I, I hope you uh, had a chance to open up some of the pre-read materials that was sent in advance um, our goals were awareness of early signs of delays and disabilities. One of the challenges we see with children who are potentially eligible for birth to three and, and don't enroll is a wait and see attitude. And, um, and, and that causes many children who would otherwise benefit from early intervention to, to wait and see. So we also incorporated into our first 1000 days campaign uh, information to increase understanding of the program and emphasize that during the pandemic, every local birth to three program remained open and ready to serve children and families in their communities. The campaign also encouraged doctors and other professionals to talk with families about the program. Um, as well as, again, fulfilling that local requirement and supporting local birth to three programs, which, as you can imagine, um, more, more acutely during the onset of the pandemic, were quite busy. So next slide. This first, the first 1,000 days public service campaign created a number of materials. We had a great deal of input from families across the state to learn from them about how they found out about early intervention from their experience and what would help them or help them um, in hindsight for the next family. So we had a robust social media uh, campaign and a toolkit and we developed materials for families and we developed different and additional materials for professionals and other uh, key referral sources. Next slide. The materials for families focused on things that were easily digestible by families in um, quick, quick and uh, easy uh, information. So if you get an opportunity to, to click on this link and look at the slide, you'll find again, brochures explaining what the birth to three program is for families and the importance of acting early and, and how um, doing so can remediate or mitigate delays and, and help children catch up. The website advertisement was uh, also reiterated the importance of acting early. 
and emphasize the emphasize key features of child development specifically that early intervention could support and promote. And social media, which was a great asset to our campaign, encouraged families to track their development and act early and explaining the benefits. All of these materials were also um, developed in English, Spanish, and Hmong. Next slide. Here's a snapshot of some of the materials that we created. Uh, next slide. Wanted to also um, share a little bit of, of, of context for how professionals are a critical referral source uh, for birth to three programs. Physicians are our number one referral source, followed by families um, are our second referral source. Um, so this information for the professionals was referral tip sheets, information about how to talk with families about how um, child development can be supported by early intervention and a, a strong catalyst for doing that. As we see many families uh, question the need to intervene and it can be a scary time to hear that your child might um, not be um, developing at the rate of their peers. Next slide. So how did our campaign go? Um, as this slide illustrates, it was super successful. Um, Pre-pandemic, we had a pretty steady ebb and flow of referrals around uh, 1,200 to 1,600 kids each month get referred to the Birth to Three program. We dropped to uh, 564 was our all-time low early in uh, COVID-19. And then as you'll see, in our um, development of our public service campaign materials and kicking off our first 1000 days campaign, we were able to um, reach and then exceed our previous referral numbers. Next slide. So that was about referrals, how many children got referred to birth to three. The next slide um, talks about enrollment, which is the goal of, of the referral system. Um, and you'll see a similar trend here. Um, lagging just a month or so behind when the campaign kicked off, um, children enrolled in birth to three at a much higher rate than they had previously. So again, super successful, but um, campaigns and um, marketing materials are uh, critically important to continue to ebb and grow from what you've learned. So where we're at today, next slide, please. We do. Um, we are committed to annual child find activities using continue the materials that we have already developed as, as shown here today. We are also um, monitoring our um, materials. Uh, we can see how many clicks come to um, our website. We also mail out printed materials for all the brochures to local programs. And so we track how which materials get the most asked to be printed by local programs and um, will um, develop additional and future iterations of the material based on that feedback. And obviously, we also um, track all of our referrals and enrollments to continue to um, gauge whether our statewide child find system is effectively uh, reaching out, finding children and securing their access to early intervention services. Next slide. In spite of our wild success in this work that we've done, we have uh, acknowledged a couple of areas in our statewide child find system that we need to uh, continue to grow our knowledge and strengthen. And those areas include engaging directly with families of color, as well as increasing our attention to groups that are less obviously in need of early intervention uh, services, which includes low incidence disabilities of populations of children. Most common ones, um, low incident populations include children with hearing and vision impairment. Um, this uh, day two or enhanced phase of our child find work is um, expecting us to tune in more intentionally to who's not at the table and who's not adequately represented in our child find work. And next slide. So with that in mind, I really um, 
come here today with that um, acknowledgement and recognition that this is what we've done. We think it's good. We think it's good. We think it has met the need, the initial need of addressing during COVID. But there is so much more that we as a state could do to support access to early intervention services. And so anybody who would love to share these materials on your website, um, include them in articles in any newsletters or publications that you produce. And as you heard from some of our uh, speakers already this morning, all of us know somebody who have, has a child or a neighbor with special needs or in special circumstances. And intervention and access to services is a, a powerful resource for families to grab onto when they're in um, that position in their life. So um, any, any opportunity to share this material and share your wisdom with us about what more uh, you would like us to consider and what more we could do. Next slide. That's it. That was Deb, thank you so much. And I'm I'm so glad that you included that that sort of ask at the end. Um, I think one of the um, one of the the benefits of this um, council is that we do have um, unlikely unlikely attendees at this table. And I, I'm sorry, I always feel uh, I, a little bit um, embarrassed to call out like our friends from DOT. It's like DOT, we, and I'll be really honest, we said DOT, you know, like, we, we love you guys. We're so happy when you come to these meetings. Um, but if this isn't relevant to you, you know, let us know and, and when we'll, you know, we can, you know, downsize the group. And they say, no, we are always looking for those ways to connect to, to you know, to kids and families and to Wisconsinites. And so, you know, I think about sort of our unusual um, ideas uh, in terms of outreach, in terms of getting these materials into the hands of Wisconsin families. And, um, you know, and I, and I also think about kind of the portfolio of our different agencies and how they interface with families, um, how they interface with Wisconsinites. And so if, um, if one of my colleagues from an agency was having a light bulb moment, please reach out to Deb and say, gosh, I've got a little bit of a wacky idea here, but what do you think about this? Um, you know, I think about um, uh, parents who are in the care of the Department of Corrections um, and, and what might be a, a possible inroad there. Um, I think about billboards on highways um, and, and campaigns around that or, um, you know, in the, the DMVs around our state, you know, there, there are just some interesting ways to think about how to get the word out. And so, I, Deb, I really appreciate that call to say, you know, think about this. What haven't we thought of yet in terms of reaching families? Any questions at all for Deb? Um, really appreciate the overview that that there was some really important and new information in there for me. All right, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Deb. What I'd like to do um, with a, a mind to time is take about a five or six minute break. Let's call it six minutes so that by my clock, that's uh, 10.08. And then we'll come back and hear from uh, Jenny at the DPI. So um, 10.08, see you then.
All right, folks, I think we are um, coming back online here uh, and excited to uh, to connect another agency into this conversation. And so we now have had the background on the DCS and DHS programs. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny Bibler from DPI, who's going to help us better understand how our systems serve. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I, I know we're recording now. Okay. So Jenny Bibler from DPI, who's now going to help us better understand how our systems serve um, children ages three to five when they leave the birth to three program, and then they transition into our school systems. So Jenny is an early childhood special education consultant at the DPI. And uh, welcome Jenny to the to the group. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Secretary Amundsen. Um, just like she did, like like Emily said, it is what happens at, at when a child turns three. Um, we get that question all the time from parents. Um, and and again, so here to talk about um, really the commonality is that you heard Deb talk about. She she laid the the framework um, for the federal. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide if that would be great. Um, that framework for that child find piece. Um, as a federal law, so um, um, but so, so you'll see some commonalities, but there's going to be a few differences in, in, like Deb said, what, like Emily said, what happens when they go to the school system, and what does this, here's the big kicker, everybody, what does the school system look like when you're a three-year-old? Okay, so that, that's kind of, I think, the, the, the catch all here with, with child find. What does it look like knowing that the compulsory school attendance age in Wisconsin is age six on or before September 1st? So what happens for our three, four and five year olds if, if they don't have to um, um, attend school? Yes. So we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm going to say child find. Um, one thing that I thought about um, is um, in re you see it up here on the reg, but in, in my regular language, I would say child find is a continuous process of public awareness activities. That's a that's a, um, a term that we use um, in the um, school world, um, public awareness activities that are designed to, like Deb said, identify, locate, evaluate all children with disabilities who may be in need of early childhood special education services as soon as possible. So go ahead and go to the next slide and we're gonna talk a little bit about the public awareness um, piece um, and child find. So child, like I explained, child find and early childhood special education. So in um, at age three, um, all the way through the age of 21, but we're going to really be focusing on three, four, and five-year-olds. Um, so early childhood special education at the federal level is defined for children ages three, four, and five. So it would be three through five. And so what happens in the public school districts in Wisconsin are responsible for identifying, locating, and evaluating um, three, four, and five-year-olds. And that happens through the transition process from that birth to three, or it happens with kids out in the community. And there's lots of different ways that public school districts also have to find kids. Um, and I talked about the age three um, through five. So go ahead and go next slide. The public awareness, public awareness activities. And so I like to think about this. If child find is the what, the law that tells us we need to identify, locate and evaluate children who are at risk or who have disabilities, public awareness is the how. This is the how we find those kids within that child find that continuous um, process of finding kids. So public awareness is a term describing the efforts to inform the public about the availability of early intervention like Deb talked about, or about the preschool special education services, um, public school services for young children, again, who might be at risk for developmental delays or who have disabilities. So school districts, there could be many, but here again, here are ways that public school districts, is, districts will reach out to the community to say, hey, we are the ones that will locate identify and evaluate, and then if eligible, provide services for um, children in um, um, that are residents of our public school districts. So they will do this through community websites, of course, through the school district websites, through other community websites. 
through um, county um, health departments, local physicians' offices. You might see, you'll see a child find notice that we, we use. Um, public Deb talked about public service announcements, billboards, again, electronic billboards, um, same thing. Direct mailings and emails, other social and news media. And then the one that I wanted just to just highlight specifically are screenings. Um, um, the screenings that um, can be used. And this is where I see the connection with this group, um, some of those things for screenings. So if you go to the next slide, when we use screenings as a public awareness activity, um, things that happen during a screening, and I'm just going to use screening in a lowercase s, so different types of screenings. Um, we're going to educate families about typical child development. So if I'm educating a family about typical child development through my screening, I'm learning where my child might be within that range and kind of go, hmm. Um, develop and expand an awareness of the community resources for young children. So as I'm screening my child, that person, that, that screener um, who's administering that screening can help me go ahead and navigate where I might need to go next as a, as a, as a parent or a caregiver. And then again, the, the third and most important piece on a screening is that question and deciding. As I talk with that screener, about the results of, of my child's screening, um, I may work with them a little bit to say, what are my next steps? And that's the most important thing in the screening. It's not just administering it, but what are the next steps? And what is that discussion between, again, parent caregiver and the screener to know that, um, you know, do we make a referral? Do we wait and see? Do we try some opportunities um, in the communities, different things, um, and really have that discussion based on the results of the screening? Um, if that child may, if, if need, need a further um, comprehensive evaluation for special education. So I really wanted to bring up why we do screenings and hopefully this group um, can see themselves in that screening process, especially on the next slide. So these are just a few of the screenings. Go, go ahead, go, go back one on the screenings, I think. Andrea, if you're, yeah. There we go. So these are just types of screenings that we consider a public awareness activity under child fines. So again, you can see the connections. And I just, just pulled out a few of them. I know, Deb, you had a few of these too, a newborn screening, blood levels, um, the vision and hearing through well, well baby checks, well child checks, um, developmental um, screenings. They're all over the place. Behavioral screenings whether it's an autism screening, a social and emotional screening, a language or a pre, uh, speech and language screening that can be done at a private level, a community level, a county level, um, those type, those places. And then again, a universal screening for instruction. So this one, everybody, so if a child's already, and I think Erin, you mentioned this, that in that 4K um, classroom, or could be in a 5K classroom, or even beyond, could be a first grade classroom, they would do universal screenings just for instruction to see where that, you know, child is and how the teacher can adjust instruction. Something might come up from that too. So um, that even within the school districts, they might make, um, um, a referral. So these are ways that, again, we use screenings to find our kids. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I said it's a continuous process. Um, one thing about that that's different about uh, public schools, as we all know, that's that's different from um, birth to three program or early intervention programs is they the earlier intervention programs are, they run on a 12 month calendar. They're year round, they're continuous. School districts, as we know, um, are nine months. However, under federal law, child find is a continuous process and it does run <laughs> 12 months a year. So um, school districts are responsible to continue their child find efforts through the summer, through um, holiday vacations, through spring breaks. Um, they are part of that. So that is a, that's important to know. Um, and as when we do about, when we talk about child find, um, it is, it includes all children. And of course, Deb talked about our infants, toddlers, and I'm talking about our preschoolers, but we also, school districts are also responsible on finding and, and connecting and coordinating to find children who may be at a private um, institution, whether that's a private preschool, could be a faith-based um, um, church preschool programs. They could be private um, clinics, private um, um, developmental programs, autism programs, again, other public um, agencies, YMCAs, United Way programs, things like that, tribal school children. 
connecting with the tribal schools, um, highly mobile children. So we need to, they need to make concerted efforts to find um, children that are highly mobile, um, whether that's connecting with um, um, shelters is a big one. Um, homeschool children, we also need to um, make sure that we are reaching out and to um, children that are homeschooled or that are at home and then migrant children too. So these are some of our more underrepresented to underrepresented children that families that um, we really um, work with child find on that piece. So we wanted, that's how we define the all children. Okay, go ahead. And this is my favorite. Um, Aaron, you may recognize this one. Aaron, um, as my predecessor in this position for um, a little over 10 years ago, um, we had this, we've used this for so many years, but I love this slide. Um, we call it our informed referral network, but for this purpose, I renamed it for our child find partners. I know the print is very small. This is a, this is on our child find brochure, but hopefully you can see yourselves. And I call these our community partners that we rely on to help us identify, um, locate, and so that we are able to evaluate children. I won't go through the list. I think it's a fabulous list though. Um, and again, it's, it's may not be limited. This is an extensive list, but, um, these these are the partners, again, that I'm going to probably speak for Deb too, and, and ourselves that um, we need to connect with. So we have a big job as um, public school districts to make sure that we have connections at that local level or even at that regional level. And then we, as a state level, like we're doing right now, um, can reach out to all these different community partners that, um, and, and it's a two-way street on this part. So we need to reach out to lend them to let them know that if you, if you have a family you're working with that may be in need of special education services, maybe have a disability, here's call us and we'll, we'll make, the, and as far as a referral and an evaluation, or we need to coordinate with you so that you know when you're talking to a family, you know who to refer that child to. And I think that's the missing link in this piece with any of these. They need to know that, um, again, if it's a zero to uh, birth to three, they would give um, birth to three a call to make a referral. And if the child is three, um, actually 321, but for this purposes, we'll say three through five, that you call your local public school district special education department and let them know that I have a concern. So, okay, go ahead. And next slide, um, the birth to three, the transition. Again, this is one of our greatest, Deb talked about referral sources. So believe it or not, trend, um, the birth to three is considered a referral source. And yet we talked about if child find is a birth through 21, um, the federal law does um, regulate that children who are in birth to three programs who are turning three have a seamless, and that's the word that's used in the federal law, a seamless transition from those early intervention programs to school services without a break in those services. And so that's where that summer comes in and those things. So just to know that birth three will, will help with a transition plan to help parents um, and, and families um, go through this process as they're transitioning into the school system. They'll have a transition planning conference in which the school attends. So that's just so you know is how we introduce, how um, school districts introduce themselves to families and families can talk about their child and introduce their child to the school district. Um, then we have the referral process from the birth to three um, um, to the school district if they feel that the child may be potentially eligible. And then of course, um, like Deb talked about, we have at the school district level, um, we have evaluation, we have eligibility, a child does need to qualify. And then of course we develop an IEP, which is an individual education program in which um, goals and services are um, determined by an IEP team. Um, the timeline, which this makes this is very specific for birth to three compared to other children that are um, beyond the age of three. The timeline that when you what you see on this screen, all these bullet points have to fit in a certain time when the between when the child is two years and three months up to that third birthday. So there's a very specific timeline that all that stuff needs to happen. And school and districts need to make sure they are partnering with those county birth to three programs so that they are both in sync with these timelines to make sure by federal law and more importantly to families that there is a seamless transition and no break in services um, when that child turns three. So I wanted to include that part, which makes 
um, our connection um, with DHS and birth to three, um, not only federally required, but um, um, beneficial and um, important to families. Okay, go ahead. Next slide. So just like Deb said with ours, what would be the next steps if we do the screenings and we've talked about public awareness, we've talked about the transition. What are those next steps if I have a concern, if I as a parent, a caregiver, if I'm a, um, I'm, I'm a screener or if I'm a um, child care provider, what do I do if I have a concern or I suspect that the child may have a disability? Those next steps would be a referral, to make a referral. And a referral is, is as simple as giving, you know, picking up the telephone or sending an email to the director of special education. I always tell people that's the best place to start is go to your special education department you can ask for the director, but usually anybody that picks up the phone <laughs> at a special education department um, can help a family um, um, begin that process. Um, and every school district, yes, offers and provides special education services. Um, the next step would be that comprehensive evaluation. Um, we consider it a comprehensive evaluation for special education services. So even though somebody um, may make a referral because of uh, a speech delay, um, the school district is obligated and responsible for a comprehensive evaluation to make sure that they're um, addressing all the different developmental domains so we don't miss a piece when we're doing that evaluation. Again, there's a determination of a disability and uh, um, a need for special education. And then, of course, I talked about that IEP, IEP development. And if you go to the next slide, what about that IEP? Um, these are special education services, special education and related services that may include, but not be limited to. And you can kind of see um, as far as um, what's available. Um, depending on um, the disability related needs based on that evaluation. So you've got the specially designed instruction, you can see all the different therapies, behavior therapies, um, social skills, psychological services. And then we have one more, if you go to the next one again, um, this is not a pick and choose menu. Um, these are services that are I, um, determined by the IEP team, of course, um, in which the parent is a member, parent or family or caregiver um, 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 is a, a member of that IEP team. And again, they're based on the disability related needs of the child counseling. And then I guess we have our orientation, mobility, interpreting. You can really see the wealth of information uh, or wealth of services that can be provided depending on what we call the unique needs um, of a child with a disability, including special. So we were talking, somebody, Emily, I think you mentioned um, DOT. What does DOT? There you go. Look at the bottom one. <laughs> you have so special transportation for children that are not able to um, use the, the, the transportation for um, the general education children. Um, special education, special transportation has to be addressed if a child actually needs it. So there you go with that one. <laughs> Just gave you a great um, connection with that one. And then where the location. Um, and then again, because I, I mentioned that children do not technically have to go to brick and mortar school or homeschool, of course, um, um, six, where can they if they're and, and I loved Erin's um, where she talked about child care and she talked about Head Start and we have private preschools. So where can these services, these early childhood special education services be provided? They're going to be provided where we find children at that local level. So I'm if I'm um, in the town of New Richmond, I'm going to say, where are my where do my three and four and five year olds go to school? Where are they? Where are they located? Are they at home? So these are places that, again, um, special education services can be provided in a regular early childhood program. I'm just kind of throwing our, our common ones, which would be a 4K, a 5K, it, um, uh, a Head Start, a, any of the child cares, um, the three year old programs, some um um, districts call them a 3K. They can be district sponsored. Um, they can be play groups or what I like to call learning groups for three-year-olds with um, disabilities and without disabilities. It could be wraparound school district where they have wraparound care in the morning and the afternoon um, and child care. They could be special education programs, whether those are private or um, sponsored again or operated by the school district. They could be in the home. Um, what a wonderful place. So even, so we talk about birth to three providing services in the home um, that can continue, that may continue. 
for a child who is age three, four, or five. Could be private preschools. Um, we have our 4K community approaches. And then even in the community, um, libraries, YMCAs, Mother's Day Outs, um, some of those different types of programs. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that um, um, for, for three, four, and fives, we are truly community-based with this. Um, and how is that decided? Again, the location, the frequency, how often would a child receive services, and what is the amount? That is not decided by myself or Deb, Deb Rather Molliner. <laughs> it's not me who decides that, which is a good thing. Um, it is that individual uh, education or IEP team that makes that decision. And thank goodness they're basing it on um, the student's um, needs, the disability related needs. And so that's um, how we, and then from there, of course, um, that would be another conversation um, as we move into the school system. And then eventually, I just wanted to give a shout out for our adult services. So that is our continuum. And that's all I have. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, super helpful to sort of understand the trajectory uh, and the braidedness of these um, of these sort of interlocking programs. And um, and also, you know, I think just hearing again from these talented colleagues um, from three agencies, it's also really complicated, right? It's very complex. And um, and so I think that this this notion of um, of like hearing from folks who have navigated this system is incredibly important. And I know that um, from DHS to DPI to DCF, really uh, finding and lifting up the parent voice, the parent experience, the user experience in the, the birth to five program is just incredibly important and, um, and increasingly important in thinking about how we optimize service delivery for those families. Um, so really, really grateful um, to now pivot over to Trisha Murphy. Um, and I know, Erin, you all are going to do a little bit of um, question and answer here. Um, Trisha, again, um, we want to thank you for serving uh, and for, for donating time to the um, Parent Advisory Committee. Um, and now, you know, to be pulled in uh, here as well, we, we so appreciate your time uh, and your commitment to sharing, uh, to sharing your voice and the voices of, of folks in your community. So, Erin, um, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to um, facilitate this part. Sounds great. Thank you. Christian and I, you had a uh, conversation where I definitely got to know her story. And I think it's a powerful, and it really highlights how our systems in Wisconsin work. And so I have a, a couple of questions that we prepared. Uh, and start by asking those questions so you can hear more about So Trish, let's start off with um, where, you, where you currently live and how long you live. Um, my name is Trisha Murphy. Um, I live in Adams County. I've been in Adams County for 22 years now. Um, I lived in the city of Adams for 12 years, which has a population about 2,400. Um, then me and my husband moved to New Rome in the northern part of Adams County, and we've been here for about 10 years now. When we talked earlier, you talked a lot about um, you and your husband, which I think there's a great, great share a little bit about what you and your husband do. Um, I've been a stay-at-home mom for the last nine years now um, with my husband's job. My husband is a um, sheriff deputy for the Adams County Sheriff's Office for the last 11 years. So I made the sacrifice of becoming a stay-at-home mom because of his schedule. Um, I also do child care for um, people in my community. All right, let's talk a little bit about your children. Uh, what are your children's names and how old are they? I have three children, two boys and one girl. My oldest is Michael. He is nine. My middle child is Vincent, who is four, and our youngest is Briella, who is two. Right, let's talk a little bit more about their strengths and their interests. 
and the things that you all love to do together? Well, we love camping together as a family. We've been traveling throughout Wisconsin at different campgrounds. We were just at three campgrounds in nine days last month. So, yeah, um, we love doing that. Um, my oldest son, Michael, he's very interested in dinosaurs, Pokemon, and being the best big brother that he can be to his two siblings. Um, he's very, his strengths are really good at math. I'm, he did not get that from me. <laughs> so, and he's, and his attention to details. He loves to be right in the zone. Our Vinny, our miracle baby, um, loves dinosaurs because of his older brother loves dinosaurs. Uh, he loves learning new sports. He is my sports little boy. Um, just to love new things, curious and definitely part of growing personalities. He's just, he's so different. And then our little one, Briella, she's just two yet, so we really don't know yet much, but she loves being around her brothers and being with them. And the other thing is she loves to dance when I'm cleaning the house with mom. That's one of my things that I do is listen to music while I clean up and she dances. I love that. <laughs> one of the things we, we had talked about previously um, was when you noticed um, each of your children might be additional um, and services. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like, what you noticed? About so my, when Michael was born, we everything was fine. Um, Michael wasn't saying a lot of words as a small child. And as I call it, he would talk like a minion because it was a minion talk. He wasn't saying his words. And Vincent, who was our preemie, who was born at seven months, I knew right away that he was going to need the extra help. And then now with Briella, she's in the birth of three program as of right now to help her talk at a two-year-old as so she can form her words. I think that was question number five, right, Aaron? That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to listen to what all the kids are doing. <laughs> so. You are a great multitasker. I try. Um, you're doing great. How, how the, the services um, that your children received helped them and, and your whole family? So um, the different... The similar or different among each. Okay. So we didn't really know that he had a delay of the talking until my husband went to kids day that we do every year in Adams County for the kids. And he just went up to Candy, who's head of the birth of three program in our county and said, Hey, my son's not talking and he's two years old. She goes, well, I can come over and do a evaluation on him and she did and yep he got in it for it so that's how we learned about it um with with Vinny when he was born two months early I knew right away we were gonna have problems because of his delays and everything his body wasn't at a nine month old, their nervous system's not all the way developed or anything like that. So I knew the signs. So right when we got home after 54 days in the NICU, I called Candy up and said, Candy, we're home. Can you come on Monday morning <laughs> to check them out? So we did that and I knew the signs. Um, and then we had our daughter and then when she didn't start talking by like saying mama or daughter words, I'm like, well, now I got another one. <laughs> so. <laughs> I called Candy up, she came over and she got in for her speech as well. I also teach the sign language for to help them to say their words. And my daughter does not want nothing to do with sign language, but my two boys did. So. I think this is such a great example of a child of really highlighting what both Seth and Jenny talked about, about earlier in your relationship with with the birthday program, really strong something that you talked about. 
a lot when we were, when we were chatting. Um, one of the, you, you mentioned too that you're, you're an educator, you're a healthcare provider. Um, can you talk a little yes. bit about your experience with bringing other children? So I've been doing this now probably about seven years. Um, I get different kids from different ages. Um, I recently just got a little girl who's going to be a year old next month. Um, she was at a different dare care provider who wasn't working with her and not doing a lot of things that she's supposed to. So when I got her, I noticed a lot of signs from my three previous children. Um, eight months old, you should be already crawling, getting that, ha that hand and eye coordination, um, holding a bottle by yourself, you know, a lot of those things. So she wasn't doing any of that. She had no hip movement, nothing. And I'm like, well, I talked to her mom and I'm like, don't be frustrated, but I'm seeing a couple of signs that just go talk to Candy about. And she did, and now she's in the birth of three program. So her physical therapist comes to my house every other week to work with her. And the last two months I've had her, she's holding her bottle. She's crawling. She's doing what a nine month old, 10 month old is supposed to be doing now. So I work really hard with every kid that comes into my house. Um, and a lot of the kids notice what are the bigger kids doing? They want to do that. The youngest one I have is going to be six months and she's already ready to go to crawl. <laughs> so it's, it's a little chaotic now. <laughs> So I just, I can't go over the, the connection really with that thing and the, the why we are such a, a good example of why we are moving this pilot program that we've talked about with between DCS and DHS and really connecting the dots in terms of um, this is huge. And referrals come from, from many different one of which, a big one is which is here. So, for connecting those dots and taking your experience and, and helping us. That's just, um, let's let's you know, to talk about yeah, education now. Uh, education can be a trial. Oh, hold on. I couldn't hear you on that one. Sorry. Yeah, you're, you're getting a yeah, little, you're getting a little choppy. I'm getting choppy. I'm getting, getting choppy. Okay. I apologize. Yeah. I apologize. Everybody. Is this better? Is this better? Okay. Okay. I thought it was on my part. About that. Okay. So let's let's talk about your your K twelve experience. Um, I believe your oh, all the services help. Yes, yeah. my oldest. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and talk. So my oldest, he's going to be in fourth grade now. I can't get over that one. Um, I'm very proud of him, of how he has come from birth of three to now. He also does still have an IEP. So we do that every, every October, or I think, yeah, because I got to remember now I have two in IEPs. Um, he is, he's... He talks really well. Math is his strength. Um, he does have um, some social skills because he was an only child. Um, he has his cousins who are almost right there in age. We have, he has two cousins that are only four months apart. But um, he loves being in school and being with his friends. He just loves it because now somebody else is his age who's in his interest. You know and he loves that and I love that too <laughs> my son has a big heart he gets attached to all the babies that I watch in my house and I he's just gonna be a wonderful kid I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your community and just about um, navigating this in your in your community in rural Wisconsin town. 
Um, so our community is very rural and it's, and it has a lot of poverty in it too. Um, the last 22 years I've seen stuff that I don't want to see for kids in our community. We have a lot of farming, livestock and crops. My father-in-law does soybeans for part-time. Um, there's a little industrial for many people. There's not much here, industrial stuff. But that's also draws really nobody into our community. You know, they don't want to build this thing or, you know, the community doesn't want this or that. And it's like, well, we need that to build our community. We need that to bring more things in for our children. Well, I live in Rome, and Rome is growing unbelievable in the last 30 years that I've been coming here. Um, the summers are the most popular because of the lakes and the golf courses that we have here. Um, but once winter comes, it's businesses are really at a low because there's nothing here for them to do. And really, it's just snowmobiling, but a lot of times we don't get that much snow for snowmobiling so it's it's hard to to get things when the when the community doesn't want something new coming in and we closed down in just another school in our community last year you talked a lot about hate from your businesses in the community uh, do you want to yeah. You know, there's been things for a water bottle company or, you know, just that would give about 500 jobs or 400 jobs to our community. And that would, that would help out us a lot because you have how many people that live in poverty who are on food share or, you know, a lot. Of, how can I say this without crying? I, when my son goes to school, and they give away the lunches, I tell him not to take it. Because I know that there are kids in my community who do not have food. And the only food that they see is during school. Um, they also have washers and dryers for the kids who need their clothes washed. So I show my son that we don't need it. Give it to somebody who needs it more. And also, our high school does a food pantry for their kids during the school year, where the kids can go and get meals for them for the weekend, so they have food. And I think with more things coming into our community, I think we would get out of that, and I don't have to see these kids every morning when I drop off my son in dirty clothes or that look horrible. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. You're you're real. <laughs> And this is real in communities across the country. Thank you. Yeah. One of the exciting things you talked about, Trisha, uh, from your, from your um, is the the work that the sheriff's office is doing to keep children with autism safe. Yeah. So what what that program is? It's called Project Lifesaver. And with this program, it, you, um, it provides family with a transmitter worn on the ankle or on the wrist for the child that wanders. Um, the, sheriff ha the sheriff's office has the equipment that can be used to locate the child before they get in dangerous, serious dangerous conditions. Um, the sheriff's office works with the health and human services and other agencies in the area, such as North Star Service, so the quality people can have for those needs. So like one time they did have, I remember this because he was working that day, one of the autistic children just left the house for some odd reason. And he was out by... Oxford, almost to Oxford, and he walked almost all the way into Adams 
because he wanted to go to, he just wanted to walk. And they found him right on County M and it was like three hours later when they found him. So because he just walked. So that's one of the things that they do. My last question for you, Trisha. Um, what are you most looking forward to in your future? What am I looking forward? My kids grow up and they don't see so much of the hate in our community or the hate in the world. When I grew up, I was a kid. I just had fun and my grandparents taught us how to love and respect people. And that's what I'm doing. I want them just to be themselves, just to grow up and have fun, live your dreams. I didn't live out my dreams, but you know what? It's okay though, because I wouldn't change anything for the world right now, what I do. I can't thank you enough for being here and for sharing your story. It's powerful. Thank you. And this is why, you know, you're, you're a strong member on our parent advisory committee. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Trisha. Appreciate it. No hugger babies for us. Yeah, they just got up from their nap, so yeah. All right. So sounds good. Thank you. Thank um all right, folks. Well, um I I hope you um I I guess I think that's a tough conversation to follow um from the perspective you know i think like talking and having our um having our, our presenters really share you know how these pieces are supposed to work and then to be able to hear from trisha um and and really i mean it, it's a story about the micro and it's also a story about the macro um and i love how trisha's story um, focus specifically on aspects of the birth to three program uh, and the, the school age program that have been really powerful and beneficial. Um, but I think she also touched on some issues that are so much bigger uh, and so much more about communities and the communities we want to see uh, in Wisconsin and sort of what is our stake in creating the kinds of communities and community networks that um, truly support families. And so really, really um, so proud to, to, um, to have Trisha as part of our, um, our advisory committee and it's, it's voices like hers that are um, that are helping us really understand how our policies um, work and don't work. And, and that's what we're really asking. We've got a meeting coming up um, in just a few days, and we're really asking our, our parent advisors to help us understand the, the not working part just as much as the working part. Um, so with that, we have just a couple of minutes, and I'd really like to just kick it open to see if anyone has um, any thoughts, perspectives, um, questions, comments after um, hearing so much from uh, different agencies and, and from, from uh, all of us this morning. Questions, comments? I always like to live it, leave it nice and broad um, because Again, we always just want to welcome. Just like, what are you thinking about right now? Where's your where? Um, where is your brain going? Um, is there something you've learned today um, that you didn't know before? I think uh, for a lot of us on today's call, this was probably a lot of new information. Um, but I'm really interested in like, what are you going to take away? Where? Um, what? What is something that you feel like you got in your back pocket now that you didn't have before? Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Catherine. Oh, I wasn't sure if I was going to interrupt anyone. No. Um, first of all, I thought all the presenters were great. And Trisha, it's great to hear some 
you know, information from someone out there who's experiencing and living in a community with um, a lot of these issues. So thank you again for sharing that. I know you're very busy. Um, I wanted to mention our department, um, our department often doesn't have much to contribute to these conversations, but one thing that we've been pretty involved in is ABLE. It's a, it's a savings program for um, people with disabilities. And I have a very good friend with a child who's now 27, um, who has used a lot of different programs. And she often talks about how important ABLE is. It's um, for saving for issues. And if there's a way that we can help uh, distribute that information in any of your programs, I think that would be a good collaboration because often what I hear is people aren't even aware of the program. So I just wanted to add that. And thanks again for such a great um, presentation today, everyone. Yeah, thanks for making that connection. And I think that's a really helpful one for us. Appreciate that. Any other comments from Lisi members? I see in the chat, thank you, Olivia. Um, she wants to thank Trisha specifically for sharing her experience with us. We, we all appreciate that. Um, Secretary Barca, how to approach families looking for services. I think that was helpful. I really love Trisha's um, story about, you know, um, the kids day out being the place um, and just the, the power of putting up that tent and being at that place where families are naturally coming together. Um, is a is just a, a wonderful example of how child find works. Any other comments or thoughts before we wrap it up today? All right. Well, I think I gave my sufficient teacher wait time on this, um, which isn't as good as it used to be, frankly. Um, I've got to go back into a classroom, I feel like, and freshen up a little bit. Uh, really appreciative of the time that all of you spent with us this morning. Um, I want to give a preview to our next um, Lisi meeting, which will, I think, be in late October. And um, we plan, um, at least right now, I, I think those of you that um, are frequent attenders of this meeting know that we really worked at the beginning of the year to surface some uh, key topics and wanted to hear directly from members about um, where they wanted to be in this conversation and topics that were particular to them. And that's really how we built the year's uh, slate. So we plan to return to our conversation around workforce and business. Um, in uh, our October meeting, we want to explore what we've learned, uh, not only from the DCF investments that we've made, but also from uh, some of our other partner agencies, and really try to tell the stories of, um, again, sort of the, the first tier investments and interventions that we're making uh, to impact kids and families, but also sort, sort of circling back to Danielle's uh, comment when she was talking about the Workforce Innovation Grants, there are certainly um, so many investments that this administration is currently making that, um, that have that sort of secondary impact or second tier impact on kids and families. Um, and that that goal is part of the overall impact goal of a particular investment or a particular program. So we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, as always, uh, really appreciate your representation as an agency, and please let us know if there's a connection that can be made as a result of something that you heard today, um, because really this has been a very fertile ground for building those next conversations that can happen uh, whenever you pick up the phone. So thanks everybody and uh, have a wonderful waning days of summer. I hope you, um, I hope you uh, find some great sweet corn if that's your thing. Um, and uh, hope, hopefully uh, see some of you at the state fair over the coming week. Take care everybody. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>